On September 15, 1984, a new series entitled Pryor's Place premiered on CBS during its Saturday morning kids block. The show was an unlikely collaboration between two iconoclastic forces in entertainment, and many saw it as a bold creative risk. While the show sparked controversy, Pryor's Place would ultimately go away as quickly as it came, leading many to wonder what happened. If there's one comedian that defined the 1970s, it would have to be Richard Pryor. The New York-based stand-up comic had risen from the club scene in the 1960s to become a regular on the national talk show circuit, before moving to Hollywood to write for sitcoms in the early 70s. By the mid-70s, he was a household name, starring in feature films like Silver Streak and Blue Collar, and playing the titular role in The Wiz. Pryor was known for pushing the envelope in his comedy, covering topics like race, sexuality, and religion. Despite this, he had also begun making appearances in more kid-oriented content toward the late 70s, making guest appearances on PBS's Sesame Street and making a cameo in 1979's The Muppet Movie. Meanwhile, in another sphere of entertainment entirely, brothers Sid and Marty Croft had become ubiquitous in children's television. The siblings began their career as puppeteers in the 1940s doing live shows, eventually moving into the landscape of Saturday morning TV where they created the iconic HR Puff and Stuff in 1969 and worked on dozens of memorable series and specials throughout the next decade. The brothers were known for their trippy, fantastical style, a low-budget aesthetic that made them household names. Toward the late 70s, the duo began branching out beyond children's programming, producing variety series aimed at adults. Fast forward to summer of 1983. Marty Croft makes a lunch date with CBS's newly appointed vice president of children's programming, Judy Price. Price had been instrumental in the creation of CBS's School Break Specials, a series of TV movies aimed at kids that often dealt with serious issues. Price's next move was to lure big-name talent to produce series for CBS's Saturday Morning Kids Block. By this point, the Croft brothers had moved on from Saturday mornings entirely. While their shows had been known for being imaginative and unique, the 80s had ushered in a new wave of Saturday morning kids' shows, consisting mainly of fast-paced cartoons. These shows were often based on existing properties and created as marketing tools for toy companies. The Crofts had become disenchanted with Saturday morning TV for this reason, but Price was dead set on getting the brothers back in the game. Marty recounts that during their lunch, Price suggested that he and his brother create a new show for CBS with a twist a Saturday morning kids show with a big name celebrity as the star. Off the top of his head, Croft responded, you mean someone like Richard Pryor? Price's eyes reportedly lit up at this comment, and from there, Croft set out to make this idea a reality. It would take nine months for Croft to get in contact with Pryor and secure a meeting, but once he did, he says he was able to convince Pryor to sign on within a matter of minutes. Pryor was at the peak of his career as a stand-up comic, but he said that his love for children encouraged him to take the job. CBS now had one of the top comedians in the country on board to star in a Saturday morning show. There was one problem. In the mad dash to get Pryor on board, Croft had neglected to come up with a premise for the series. Several meetings were called, and the concept for Pryor's place was eventually developed. While very few details were made public at this point, the show would be aimed at children 6 to 8, set in a neighborhood filled with kids and puppets and fantasy visitors, a format similar to Sesame Street. Writer Lorne Froman was enlisted to create the series, and a writing staff of sitcom veterans and stand-up comics was assembled, including comedian Paul Mooney, who had written for Pryor for many years. But while the show was only in pre-production, a storm was brewing on the network front. In spring of 1984, CBS held its annual affiliates meeting in Los Angeles, an event for network executives to meet with the managers of local CBS stations from across the country to discuss upcoming shows and create programming strategies. This year's meeting was overshadowed by one particular issue. Affiliates were dumbfounded as to why CBS was putting a controversial adult comedian on a Saturday morning kids show. Richard Pryor was no stranger to controversy. The edgy comic was known for pushing boundaries in his stand-up, and had developed a reputation for being a wild man in his personal life. Pryor had been hospitalized for six weeks in 1980 for burns caused by an explosion in his home and police said the incident was the result of him freebasing cocaine. While Pryor had renounced the drug and discussed his experiences with addiction in his 1982 concert film Live on the Sunset Strip, 
CBS affiliates were not convinced that casting Pryor as the lead in a kid's show was a good idea. One general manager from the Memphis CBS station called the decision disgraceful, while Phoenix's KTSP general manager Jack Sander exclaimed to the press, I'm very concerned. I'm not sure Richard Pryor has done anything to deserve a chance to be a prime representative to the children of America. The outcry was characterized as one of the biggest controversies of the affiliate meeting, with Sander estimating that 60% of the affiliates showed concerns about the series. Some affiliates even threatened not to air it unless they received taped episodes for advanced viewing. Pryor's previous foray into network television had not ended well, as his 1977 NBC series, a comedy variety show entitled The Richard Pryor Show, was given a 10-episode order but only aired four episodes due to conflicts with the network censors. Despite the controversy over Pryor's place, CBS stood by the comic. Judy Price explained, Youngsters will believe Pryor because he's been there. We should applaud this man's struggle. His head is straight now and he wants to give something back. Marty Croft also defended Pryor's involvement with the series, stating, He was a guy who had kind of lived his life in the fast lane. I always thought he would be a great role model. I have three daughters and I'd rather have them listen to him than someone else. Croft's opinion echoed that of the network, that when it came to drugs and other serious topics, kids would be much more likely to listen to someone like Pryor than to an authority figure like a school principal. Pryor's Place began taping in August of 1984, working its filming around Pryor's busy schedule. The first episode premiered shortly thereafter on September 15, 1984, airing opposite NBC's Mr. T, one of the most popular programs on Saturday mornings. Each episode of Pryor's Place would begin with the adult Richard Pryor taking a literal walk down memory lane in an urban-style setting. I'd like to ask the question, how many of you out there have cousins? Pryor would reminisce about his childhood, which would parlay into a story featuring Little Richie, an adolescent version of Pryor. Little Richie would face challenges that were directly inspired by actual childhood experiences of Richard Pryor, and mirrored the types of issues real kids might face. Pryor served as narrator and would also pop up in various character roles, as Bummer, a homeless man living in an alley, and Chills, a dreadlocked saxophone player who both served as sort of mentors to his younger self. Whimsical puppet characters were intertwined with other segments to offer some comic relief, and the show featured a subtle laugh track, counterbalancing the somewhat serious topics covered. I'd love it, thank you. Behind the scenes, Pryor was reportedly heavily involved in coming up with these premises, and insisted that the show tackle issues like child abuse and divorce. Thirteen episodes were ultimately taped, with a theme song sung by Ray Parker Jr., who had achieved a number one hit that summer with his song Ghostbusters. The series featured a plethora of famous guest stars, like Robin Williams, Sammy Davis Jr., Lily Tomlin, and Willie Nelson and the series even turned down an offer from Bette Midler to appear because they simply did not have enough roles. John Ritter was reportedly disappointed when he discovered that his guest role did not include any actual scenes with the adult Richard Pryor, so the writing staff wrote a new scene for him to interact with the comic legend. While the affiliate protests had received heavy media coverage, its effects did not seem to be panning out. 90% of CBS's 206 stations were carrying the show, which a CBS spokesperson described as excellent. The series did not receive any significant parental outcry at Pryor's involvement, and despite including some jokes that were clearly aimed at adults, If you don't stand up like a man, you go through life like a little pussycat. The reviews were generally positive. Critics praised the show for its tackling of real-world topics with humor and sincerity, and it was characterized as a Hail Mary in a Saturday morning landscape full of sugary cereal ads and fast-paced cartoons made to sell toys. Some critics felt that it was the best kids' show in a long time, and the series received some of the highest acclaim of the Croft's career. While the show was much more serious in tone than a typical Croft program, it had the potential to impact young audiences in a new way, with Marty Croft remarking, quote, This show says something. We're dealing with kids honestly. If you preach to kids or talk down to them, forget it. Pryor himself expressed his satisfaction with the series, telling one publication, I'm very happy with the results of the show. I'm glad the way it turned out. The show's ratings were good but not great, and while Pryor was under no contractual obligation to come back for another season, he didn't publicly rule out returning. The final episode of season one aired on December 8th, 1984, and the show continued to air in reruns into the new year. While rumors emerged that Pryor did not want to continue with the series, Marty Croft had another take, telling the press, quote, 
I gotta believe he's coming back. Croft even touted stars like Warren Beatty, Dan Aykroyd, and Bill Murray as being potential second season guest stars, saying, quote, I think this show has legs. The series would air in reruns until June of 1985, when it was removed from the schedule completely. Over the summer, Pryor's Place would receive eight daytime Emmy nominations, winning two for costume design and art direction. But despite its critical acclaim and big name star, Pryor's Place would never return for a second season and would gradually cede from public consciousness to become essentially forgotten. While CBS has never officially revealed why the series was canceled, one crew member has stepped forward to provide an explanation. Mark Evanier is a well-known comic book and television writer who served as a staff writer on Pryor's Place. According to a blog post published on Evanier's website in 2019, the show had taped six episodes before Pryor announced that he would halt work on the series to focus on the production of his feature film Jojo Dancer, a semi-autobiographical work which he would be writing, directing, and starring in. The problem was that the production was under contract for a 13-episode order, and the team only had a few months to deliver. This deadline would make Pryor's demands impossible, and after much deliberation, the crew was able to convince Pryor to stay on board for the long haul. While the show successfully cranked out the necessary 13 episodes, Pryor had reportedly become disinterested. He had accomplished what he had set out to do, and had said what he wanted to say to kids. Doing more of the series, as the blog put it, would be a dead issue. While this is only one account of why the series didn't continue, it seems that this is the only explanation that we'll ever receive. Jojo Dancer would be released in 1986 to mixed reviews, and Pryor would continue to appear in films throughout the 80s and early 90s. Pryor was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1986, and this would slow down his career considerably. He passed away in 2005 at the age of 65, having never starred in another TV show after Pryor's Place. Sid and Marty Croft, on the other hand, continued to produce children's television throughout the years, most recently producing 2016's Sigmund and the Sea Monsters for Amazon. While Pryor's Place remains largely forgotten, the series did a commendable job of attempting to create quality programming for kids on Saturday mornings, going against the grain to produce something deeper and more substantial than what was standard at the time. Rather than kowtowing to the outrage of affiliates who had never actually seen an episode, CBS and the Croft brothers stood by Pryor to realize the show's creation. Instead of stigmatizing his struggles with addiction, they allowed him a platform to try to help others learn. Perhaps Marty Croft best summed up Pryor's involvement in Pryor's Place when he said, quote, The man showed up, he delivered. I don't know another star of his magnitude who would have done it. If you'd like to watch full episodes of Pryor's Place, five of the 13 episodes are available for viewing on the official Richard Pryor YouTube channel, although strangely every episode other than the pilot is unlisted. You can access the other four episodes through the info cards at the end of each video. Several episodes were released on VHS in the 90s, however, these are incredibly hard to find and steeply priced when available. I'd like to take a moment to welcome everyone who has found my channel recently and thank you for subscribing. The sudden jolt in popularity of my older videos definitely took me by surprise, and after a two-year hiatus, I'm happy to be back making content. If you'd like to support the channel, I now have a Patreon up. There are several different tiers available, and any support would be greatly beneficial for the further development of this channel. I have a lot of ideas for future videos, and all donations will help me get closer to realizing that goal. As always, thanks for watching.